Uh, morning all. Um, odd markets. Well, I know um, Stuart was looking at the US markets. Uh, it's quite a pull. I say it's quite a pullback. It's not much of a pullback. People have made so much money this year. When you look at where it's come from since the beginning of the year, you still wouldn't be that unhappy, would you? And it's all down. Um, well, it's down to the Magnificent Seven, isn't it? Um, you've probably heard me mention that before. Morning to uh, Owen. Uh, yep, Peter, morning to you. Um, yeah, down to um, the Magnificent Seven. Mar the economists and market commentators love grouping things. Uh, you know, you've got G7, G20, G10. Um, you know, there's all these different sort of things. And uh, it used to be the uh, the fangs, wasn't it, before? But no, we, we, I think they couldn't make a, a name out of the uh, um, initials of these uh, top seven companies. So they called them the Magnificent Seven. Um, anyway, they're Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, NVIDIA, Meta and Tesla. Um, and they have accounted for much of the gains uh, in the S&P 500 that we're looking at here on the screen. Uh, the S&P 500, that's the, that's the most reliable and the one that represents the US corporate um, um, uh, capitalization as it were. It's all by market cap, unlike the Dow Jones, which is a, a price weighted index. Uh, this tells us um, how well or, or not um, the US uh, equities are doing. and you won't be surprised to know that uh, the, the slump that we've seen over the last two weeks is really down. A lot of it is down to a fall in um, the Magnificent Seven. Not so magnificent, um, but they represent about 25%, so a quarter of the total market capitalization of the S&P 500. It's huge. Uh, anyway, it's not surprising that you've seen these equities slump, of course, but they've dragged down the S&P and the NASDAQ. Uh, and not only have these, uh, well, they're trillion dollar stocks, uh, the big heavyweights um, in the US, they're also responsible for pushing the global stock index down by 4% so far this month. Yeah, Tesla, Michael says Tesla. Yeah, Tesla has fallen significantly this year. Um, well, if I go to home, I think it's TSLA, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, it's been quite a faller. But, you know, Apple, Apple's down at 166, something like that. Oh, hang on. I should have done a security. Let's go back. Uh, Tesla. Where are you? T-E-S-L-A. There we go. Yeah, um, Apple's fallen quite significantly as well. But if you look at what's actually happened here, yeah, you can see over the last year. Yeah, look at that. Huge falls. Poor old Elon Musk. He'll be running out of, because uh, he needs Tesla to support um, his investments in SpaceX and also X. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, so just to then start at the beginning, which is what I should have done, um, equities really under pressure, uh, considerable losses last week. Uh, the S&P was down, gosh, um, about uh, 160 points, which is just over 3%. The NASDAQ, uh, NAS 100, that was down nearly a thousand points. Huge, huge. That's about five and a half percent. But other markets are FTSE, that's a different beast because sterling was falling quite dramatically. That's actually helping um, our UK FTSE 100 up. Well, it's flat on the week last week. Uh, the DAX was down, not nothing like as much as uh, Europe, uh, as, as the US, I should say, but still down, what, just under 1%. Now, it's the US indices that have really kicked off. Um, and it's really down to the markets, focusing on the prospects for rate cuts. Um, and, and also this proxy war, it's sort of Israel and Hamas, which is really Israel and Iran. So Iran is fighting a war with Israel through its proxies, uh, Hamas in Gaza, uh, Hezbollah in uh, southern Lebanon, and also the Islamic uh, Jihad. So the, 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 that, that proxy war obviously come out into the open, I think, when 
um, Israel was attacked by Iran on the 13th of April. And the market, we spent all last week waiting for Israel to do something, and it eventually did. Um, but I think the, the result was quite interesting because I think markets were expecting more of a reaction and for war to escalate, but it didn't happen. It was almost like something had gone on behind the scenes where Israel was allowed to fire a few missiles at the nuclear um, sort of development region um, in Iran, just to show them that they can do that. And that the Iranians, so they wouldn't react. It was almost a set up. Uh, that was certainly reflected in the way that crude spiked above 90 bucks and then came straight back down again. Um, anyway, um, I think, the global macro issues in the Middle East and Iran and Israel, etc., is one thing. But really, I think the, the greater attention is uh, on um, expectations of rate cuts in the U.S. And at the start of the year, we, we you know, we we talk about it every time we meet. Um, but at the start of the year, um, we had this mad um, sort of almost in cloud cuckoo land, I sort of call it, um, where the markets uh, were expecting seven rate cuts um, by year end. I've actually got on the screen here, this is where rates are going to be at the end of this year. And it's worth looking at this because at the beginning of the year, investors were expecting rates to be somewhere around 3.75. Yeah. Well, at the end of this year, you can see that rates are going to be around four and three quarter to five percent, and they're currently at five and a quarter to five and a half. So we are talking about just two, two. It was an anticlimax at the end, says a uh, yeah. I think you're referring to um, the Israeli uh, um, strike, but it was interesting because investors now, or well, certainly the oil market, believes that the the, the, the risk has uh, de-escalated, but I, I, I still think it's there. I, I'd be surprised if uh, these markets just uh, turn around and go back up again. Anyway, we're, appro we're approaching May, you know, sell in May and go away. So uh, seasonally, uh, stocks um, have a more challenging time. Yeah, so um, anyway, um, we were talking about interest rate expectations. We were talking about what it's looking like at the end of the year, and I think even the three rate cuts at the Federal Open Market Committee, those are the people at the Federal Reserve who decide on interest rates, even those expectations have been dialed back by investors. So we've had this sticky inflation that um, came out, what was it, on the 10th of April or some, somewhere around then. Um, and then it was matched by retail sales last week. I think. If you just have a quick look, quick calendar look, retail sales, really strong. Someone said to me um, in an email, how come retail sales suddenly becomes really important? We've never really sort of focused on retail sales. Well, the reason why is that inflation's above where the Fed and the market's expected. And because inflation is quite high, you'd think it would dampen down retail sales. And that's what's really caused the market to have a real wobble last Monday when this data came out. Um, and, and indices actually last Monday reacted really badly to that data. So if you look at the S&P 500, oops. So that was, that was last week, that candle there. So yeah, big move, uh, Thursday, Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday. Yeah, that's, that's that candle there. And actually, you can you can see S&P and the Nasdaq. I can tell you, fell more than one and a half percent. Those retail sales, that's retail sales data, was was a lot stronger than expected. Not only higher than expected, a lot stronger than expected the current one, but they also revised the previous one up as well. So, um, not what the markets wanted to see. And then you had the European indices reacted on a Tuesday because the markets, uh, a lot of the falls in the US happened after the markets uh, in Europe closed. And then you had um, the FTSE, I think the FTSE and the, the European stock 600. I know we don't have it on our watch list here, but the European stocks 600, that's the top 600 stocks in Europe, that was down one and a half percent. And that's the biggest one day fall in nine months. Anyway, I think 
I think the European reaction was more of an overreaction, in my opinion, because I think the European Central Bank and the Bank of, Bank of England are not under such, well, I can't I say investor pressure because central bankers wouldn't say that they're ever pressured by investors, but it's a sort of expectation um, that the Federal Reserve is under. And I think some commentators in the UK believe that, it, that the forward rate swaps here are actually too optimistic about rate cuts. But in, but in the US, the Fed was under a lot of pressure at the beginning of the year, and that's sort of gone the other way. Uh, incredible. I just remember sort of lower funding costs have been a real driver in equity gains this year and indeed last year. And I think the dwindling US rate cut outlook has really taken its toll. And I think it exposes uh, these stocks, the Magnificent Seven, that have made the most gains. And I think that's the reason why you're seeing the, the pullback that we've seen. Um, a lot of people will say, oh, Jerry, but every time there's a significant dip like this, if every time there is, you buy on, you keep buying the dip. I, yeah, there you go. I can hear everyone screaming at me, buy the dip, buy the dip. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, what else is going on? Uh, dollar, well, I'm sure you all are aware that the dollar is recovering. Um, interesting article in the... Um, Financial Times about options uh, plays on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, suggesting that uh, there are increasing number of bets on euro hitting parity by year end. Isn't it weird? I thought a market correction is overdue now. Yeah, uh, Owen, I, I, I think you could have said that halfway through last year. You, you, it, it's so. It's been a, a, a massive move in equities uh, in the US with the technology sector. The changes that have been brought, brought on our daily lives uh, by the likes of Amazon and Nvidia and uh, Apple. Um, yeah, you'd think a correction would be due. Yeah, I agree. Um, sorry, we were talking about the US dollar. So um, the, the options uh, activity in the market suggest that the uh, increasing number of um, investors, hedge funds, et cetera, are looking for um, parity against the dollar. That's not a dead cert at all, because wasn't it only a couple of months ago that a, number, a couple of central banks, uh, not central banks, big investment banks were saying that the euro was heading for 110. Wow, well, here we are at what, 106.50, um, yeah. Well, it actually hit 110, didn't it? Yeah. I think that was um, before on, on its way down. Anyway, the fact is the euro is under pressure and it's likely to remain so because of the interest rate outlook in Europe with the ECB looking to cut rates on in June. And also we're looking to cut rates in June. And in fact, our, in fact sterling was really weak on Friday. Uh, and I was sort of looking at it when I got back uh, from my trip and I was thinking, I bet you that's all technical. And I think at the end of the week, last week, Sterling wobbled and then took out this 124 level. And I think it sort of opened the floodgates. And I think that's why Sterling was particularly weak. I don't think Sterling should be any weaker than the euro in terms of interest rate outlook. We're also looking to cut rates. I think it's more likely that we'll cut rates in August than, than June. Uh, there isn't a meeting in July, by the way. Uh, so it's either going to be August or June, uh, but Andrew Bailey he seems to he seems to think that um, that the that the outlook is is better for uh, cutting rates. And in fact, I think we're likely to hit uh, our two percent target here in the UK because of the cut in the um, uh, the energy price cap. I think, and that's what they call it. Um, anyway, there are some that believe that we shouldn't be doing it because inflation will pick up again. Um, it's like playing a game of chess and someone telling you what your next five moves are going to be. Yeah. Uh, the governor needs to stand for the re for the election, says Paul. Um, yeah. What, the, the general election? Andrew Bailey, Prime Minister. Rishi Sunak, Governor of the Bank of England. Quite interesting. Um, anyway, uh, that's... Uh, Currencies, just very quickly, uh, gold, 
everyone loves watching gold, talking about gold. And I think it really does continue to reflect the sort of macro events in both the Middle East and Ukraine. Uh, central bank and obviously speculative buying. There's a lot of people who've been buying gold uh, that has continued to support uh, the precious metal. But I think gold may come under more pressure because if um, uh, if the dollar continues to appreciate and the risk of a sort of a all out conflict in the middle of the East sort of continues to subside, but I sort of think that risk is going to remain until the real problems are resolved. And that's Iran's, uh, uh, you know, desire to eradicate Israel. I think that's just, yeah, general election. Yeah, I thought that's what you meant, Paul. Um, anyway, uh, that's gold. Um, in fact, it has had a bit of reaction, um, obviously, this morning. Um, and that's probably reflecting the slight cooling in the angst in the Middle East, and also probably the uh, arms deal. Uh, sorry, the uh, yeah, the um, funding uh, deal approved in Congress on Saturday, they're giving uh, 60 billion to um, Ukraine. It sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? You think it'd get them to win the war, but they said it would only slow the advance of Russia. You wonder what they've got to do. Anyway, uh, oil. Yep, a couple of questions about oil. Oil particularly weak and I think oil was really pushed higher in anticipation or held up around the 90 buck level in anticipation of an escalation in the Israel uh, Hamas Iran war whatever you want to call it last week and I think it took nearly a week for Israel uh, to respond to Iran when it sent missiles into the heart of its uh, Iran's nuclear development region I think both Israel and Iran they sort of seem to step away from an all out confrontation, which is probably likely down to some behind the scenes discussions between the US, Iran and Israel. Uh, oh, and we have a big oversupply of oil. Oh, and yeah, I think uh, you have quite a lot of knowledge on that one. And I think you're right. And I think the IEA keep on sort of swapping between a deficit and a surplus of supply. Um, but you think with what is going on, uh, that demand demand is not um, as strong as it could be or should be in in, in China, and I think um, yeah perhaps this is just the real picture now with following what happened here on Friday that big spike up to the 90 buck level that was in the middle of the night or was about half one in the morning our time um, who's trading oil then someone ended up having to pay 90 bucks for some oil anyway uh, but. Um, yeah, I, I think um, oil spiked, as as we can see on that um, that wick here on the candle on Friday, and then dropped and it wiped out the premium it took, really, in anticipation of this, this war between Iran and Israel. So uh, here we go. And, I'm, uh, and, and further weakness today as well. Yeah. OK, calendar, quickly. Uh, a quieter week for markets and data and events. Um, we've already had an unchanged uh, um, uh, uh, rate policy from uh, the People's Bank of China, the one and five year loan rates remaining uh, the same. Um, not much really going on the PCE inflation data at the end of the week, that would be really important. Uh, and also um, Bank of Japan and all this manufacturing and services um, PMI data as well. So let's just wing through it. Uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, the chair of the European Central Bank, she's speaking at Yale University. Uh, it'd be nice to get some clues about rate cuts in June. That might be helpful. Um, the euro would be particularly sensitive to anything that she says about that, of course. Uh, then we have all these manufacturing and services PMI data out in the Eurozone, UK and the US. Um, a modest recovery, really, looking at what's happening here in uh, the overall readings for the Eurozone. So slightly higher on manufacturing, slightly higher on services. Same with the US, um, but UK sort of unchanged, really, um, readings there. It all depends what they come out at, but uh, you'll note that our manufacturing is quite a bit higher than um, the Eurozone. And that's where the problem is, is that, you know, um, the manufacturing sector in Europe, especially in Germany, is so 
so depressed, uh, Germany being the biggest manufacturer in uh, the bloc and the largest economy. Uh, with a reading of 42.8. It's pretty mad, isn't it? Speculation on what they're going to do. Japanese, yes, we'll get on to that at the end of the week. The Bank of Japan, um, I've got a feeling it's going to be a bit of a damp squib, Michael. Michael. Uh, but um, anyway, so that's um, manufacturing and services data. But it's interesting, just very quickly, to notice the gap between the US and Europe. You know, when you look at what's happening in the UK and then the Eurozone and then look at the US, it's just chalk and cheese, especially in manufacturing. Um, German IFO business climate. This always used to be a high impact um, reading. It's a, a very large uh, survey of manufacturers and builders and services and retailers, etc. And it's a and there are some signs that business is improving in Germany, but I think it's probably a little bit too early to tell. Um, I think the whole block would benefit from a big improvement in Germany. But look, looking at where what's happening in China, I just don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, durable goods, uh, the core durable goods. So durable goods is what it is, um, white goods, um, uh, but they exclude big ticket items. It includes aeroplanes. It distorts the data too much, I should say. So an aeroplane costs a little bit more than a tumble dryer. Um, anyway, plus 0.3%. Um, I think I've got no comment on that, really. Um, then we jump to, um, yeah, GDP data. Here we go again. So we got the first release of the gross domestic product. That's the value of everything produced in the US in the first quarter, so that's uh, Jan, Feb and March. It's amazing that they've actually got it by the uh, 25th of um, April. Uh, anyway, they've only collated 40 odd percent of the data by then, but the first reading, two and a half percent. What would we give here in the UK or in Europe for a reading anywhere close to that? 3.4 percent in Q4 last year. These are big numbers. Anyway, the dollar will be sensitive to this but not as much as you might think, because it is backward looking. It's telling us what has happened, not what's going to happen. So it doesn't excite me much, but um, it will be talked about in the press for sure. Um, and then on to, uh, Michael, your focus on the Bank of Japan. Yeah, that's uh, gonna affect, that'll be, that'll affect all the Japanese yen pairs. So just, it's worth keeping an eye out on this one. Um, the fact is it's gonna happen when you're all asleep. But this is the Bank of Japan's monetary policy meeting. The Bank of Japan um, ended years of um, negative interest rates and raised their interest rate to plus 0.1 percent after keeping them negative for, for several years. God, it just seems forever. Uh, anyway, um, that was when they last met. Um, so the years of negative rates were reversed. The, the bank also abolished its something called its Y. Uh, it's yield YCC yield curve control, but it, it but then it said it would continue to buy bonds in the same amount, and it's like, but what's the difference? And there isn't much difference, and I think that's what really has resulted in the the weakness in the Japanese yen. When you look at dollar yen here, that is not a currency expecting rate rises, is it? And I think that's basically. What is going to happen, um, unfortunately? Um, so we're not expecting any change in rates. They're going to be kept at plus 0.1 percent. Um, and I think the view is that investors really expect the Bank of Japan to maintain very accommodative policy. What we mean by accommodative, loose. It's encouraging business. It hasn't encouraged business, but that's what it's designed to do. Uh, so accommodative is. It's, it's helping uh, the economy uh, more than, it's not a neutral policy, it, 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 it's, it's loose. Um, and, they ex and I think investors really expect any rate rises to be very slow and very gradual in the future. So, uh, but no, no change this time. And, and as you can see, that's why the Japanese yen is close to almost on its uh, recent highs or for, you have to go back decades. Uh, to see it up at these sort of levels. So uh, uh, yeah, that reflects anticipation there. We got one more bit of data, the res uh, revised uh, Michigan uh, University of Michigan consumer sentiment. 
Oh, God, no. No, no, no. What about the core PCE? Sorry, I do apologize. <laughs> this is the personal consumption expenditure. This is the really important bit of information this week. This is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. With everything going on about interest rates, with everything going on about, you know, is the economy running too hot in the US? Is inflation too sticky? The PCE was slightly better reading than the official uh, uh, CPI data from the 10th, but I'd be very interested to see where this comes out. But this is probably, for markets, the probably the most important uh, release of the week. 1.30 Friday, expected a plus 0.3%. Yeah, it's the core reading, yeah. That's the, that, that excludes those, um, those volatile comments. Everything's got a core reading these days, hasn't it? It's, don't look at the headline, look at the core. And the funny thing is, all the media publish the headline rate, and then we're told to look at the core. Really? very old. Uh, anyway, it's the inflation data that the Fed looks at. So please, please make sure you've written that one down. And then I will get on to the result of Vice Michigan consumer sentiment, but it's, you think it'd be a bit stronger than that? Retail sales, very strong last Monday. I wouldn't be surprised if that number's higher. Uh, and that really is telling us how the, the consumer is going to be behaving in the future or the economy is going to be behaving in the future. If you've got happy consumers, as the retail sales figures pointed out last Monday, companies are going to make more revenue, more revenue, more profits, better stock prices. At least that's the, that's the, the reasoning. That's it. 9.20. We didn't, well, we haven't, we haven't been on for too long, or I haven't been on for too long. But uh, anyway, you've been very quiet. Any pearls of wisdom? Any questions? Uh, yeah, where's the market going? <laughs> the trend, follow the trend. The trend is your friend. Yeah, that's, that's really it, isn't it? We have got the weekly is red now on uh, the S&P 500. Anyway, uh, yeah, no problem, Paul. Thanks very much, Pearls of Wisdom. Yeah, I hope they are. Um, thank you for your questions, including the last one about where I think the markets are going. Um, I think it's going to be tougher as we get into May, it generally always is, um, for um, certainly for equities anyway, but with what's going on in the Middle East, what's going on in Ukraine, quite a lot of uncertainty, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Owen, Paul, Paul, two Pauls. Um, uh, do have a good rest of uh, the week and we'll reconvene next Monday. All the best for now. Bye now.